morning, good evening, good night, wherever or whoever you may be. I'm Alan Arante, and this is The Recluse Podcast. Today's guest is Kathy Cameron. She is an author, model, and actress. She's originally from Alabama and attended university in Missouri, where she would earn two bachelor's degrees, one in computer science and the other in accounting. In this conversation, we discuss the influence of having a professor for a father. We discuss the dynamics between confidence and beauty. She gives advice to young, inexperienced models in terms of avoiding sketchy situations and making sure you have an advocate with you on set to turn to when you feel uncomfortable about something. We discuss her reason for writing under a pen name and how it has liberated her stylistically. She emphasizes the importance of having a good editor when writing a novel, a person who is there to see the forest for the trees. Kathy Cameron's most recent book is titled The Venus Class. It's available on Amazon. And her most recent role is in Shooters Season 1, and it's expected to be put out soon. So without further delay, this is a portrait of Kathy Cameron. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to be a nurse. And my da- my dad said to me, no, you don't want to be a nurse because the nurses don't make any money. You want to be a doctor. So I said, OK, I want to be a doctor. And I went through my early life thinking that I would grow up and become a doctor. And then I figured out that blood makes me faint. So <laughs> those uh, dreams went out the window Which is probably a good thing. I don't think I would have made a very good doctor, you know. And when you were a kid, were there things that, uh, and it's probably could still be this way today, but were there things just because you were a woman or a girl, that things you thought you could never do? Oh, I could never be an astronaut. I could never be X, Y, and Z. Or did you, were you raised or brought up to believe you could be whatever you wanted? Yeah, definitely. Uh, My dad was a university professor, and I was definitely brought up to believe that I could do anything I wanted to. However, I was embroiled in that Southern culture, so my Barbie dolls were always married with children. (laughs) Uh, So that's, you know, as a child, how I defined success really was being married and having a happy family. But no, definitely was, was brought up by my parents to to believe that I just always knew I would go to university and I could be whatever I wanted to be. So that was a good thing. They talk about, you know, pastors, kids, and I I have an uncle who's a pastor and I, my cousins, and I know that there's a lot of pressure on them to be, you know, whatever, all the superlatives you can think of just because their father's a pastor. Is there such a thing as professor's kid? Yes, definitely meant that we were supposed to, be at the top of our class, always have our homework on time. We were we were supposed to be the teacher's pets because we were the professor's <laughs> kid, especially being a daughter, by the way. I mean, we had friends that, you know, were professor's sons and not quite so much was expected of them. It seemed like to me. Anyway, that was my perspective. <laughs> so, but yes, we wow. were definitely supposed to sit on our tuffets and, and, you know, little Miss Muffet, sit on your tuffet and don't get into any trouble. Never get sent to the hall. Never be in the principal's office. Always have your homework on time. Yep, definitely. <laughs> oh, and I was friends with a lot of those preacher's kids, uh, believe me. So that is true. They were, all, <laughs> they were wild. They were fun. So, you know, I wonder if, did you have some pressure even just in grade school? Um, or maybe you were too young to really know what it meant to be a professor's kid, but was there pressure to be the the smartest kid in the class even? Uh, Definitely. Yeah. And I don't know, I'll be interested. I'll have to ask my, my, I have two sisters and I'll have to ask them if they felt it, but I definitely felt it. Hmm. And you know, I want to, I kind of want to hear you say it again. You said a second ago that it, it was different being a professor's daughter as opposed to being a professor's son. What do you think that they, maybe they just thought that the boys would have it easier in the workforce. So the girls really had to toughen up now, you know, what do you think was the reason behind that? Uh, well, I mean, there's, you've already touched on it. There's always a, or in that time 
frame, you know, in the South and maybe now in the South, there's a double standard for, you know, the, the boys are, oh, boys will be boys. Let them play football. You know, oh, he didn't have his homework or whatever. <laughs> I didn't have any brothers. So I don't know what my parents would have done, you know, if, if it would have been different for my brothers, if I'd had any. So I'm not sure, but it just felt like mm. it felt like they had it a little easier. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's that you said that you had wanted to be a nurse and your father didn't think that that was a good idea. Um, at the end of the day, was there anything they really expected of you? What do you think they hoped that you would accomplish? Did they really, your parents in general, did they want you to really just find a good man to marry? Did they just want you to get an education and pursue happiness? You know, what do you think they actually wanted for you? I think that my dad was, uh, the, we thought my dad was nuts, by the way, but there was a method <laughs> to his madness. He <laughs> wanted to make sure that his three daughters could go out in the world and make a living for themselves because there is no guarantee that you're going to get married. And if you do, there's no guarantee what's going to happen. Are you going to stay together? Is the husband going to pass away? I mean, you just, you, you, you don't know. And so my dad required my two sisters and me, when we went to university, we had to major in accounting. And the mm. reason that he did that is because accounting is business. And by learning accounting, you know, all the different parts of the business and you know how the money works. And of course, we all know the CEO is not really who runs the company, right? It's the CFO. It's whoever mm. has the money that really has the power. So I didn't want to be an accountant. So I went to university and I did what my dad required because that was what he wanted me to do. But I wanted to be a software developer. And so I also pursued a bachelor's degree in computer science. And so when I graduated, I graduated with two degrees, the accounting <laughs> degree that my dad required that I get and the computer science degree that I wanted to get. And to be honest with you, I've used the accounting degree more than I've used the computer <laughs> science degree. So my dad was a smart guy. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so you you ended you graduated with a double major. Um, wow, that I mean, I, I can only imagine how proud your father was. Um, he must have felt relieved that. Uh, well, let me ask you this, actually. Did all three of you end up graduating? All three of us graduated, but I am the only one that actually got the accounting degree. <laughs> what did so your sisters get? My older sister got married. And so my dad said before she graduated, and so my dad said, well, whatever. And so she graduated with a general business degree. And my mm. younger sister, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, he backed off with her and she got a business management degree. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's in the ballpark of uh, what he wanted from you guys, just the yeah. financial stability and, and education. Um, so you end up getting into a modeling uh, career, it seems like. And that's how I have uh, first met you was through your uh, modeling on social media. When did you start modeling and how did that come about? So that's pretty interesting, too. I, it started when I was in high school, actually. There, I'm from a small town. Well, at that time, we were living in a small town called Starkville, Mississippi. And Mississippi State University is there, and that's where my father was a professor at the time. And in the downtown of this little one red light town, there was one boutique called Dixie's Boutique. And they had, honestly, really amazing clothes for a little tiny nowhere town in southern United States of America. And they had a modeling team that, and I went and tried out for their modeling team, and they would go all around the state and model you know, fashion shows for women's clubs and churches and whatever events, you know, social events that people do uh, fashion shows for. And I tried out for their modeling team. And lo and behold, here I am today, you know, <laughs> so, but, you know, I took a, I took a left turn when I graduated university and I moved to Los Angeles. I decided I wanted, I love drama and I had been in some plays and a couple of small TV shows on PBS. 
and I decided I was going to be the next Goldie Hawn, <laughs> and that didn't work out too good. So, <laughs> but wow. Uh, so let me ask you this: You're just based on your your photos. You're obviously a beautiful woman. Um, were you a, a, a pretty girl in high school? Were you sought after by the boys, and was there sort of just this beauty about you that got you noticed by this um, boutique? Gosh, I, you know, you probably have to ask somebody else that. I was not one of the popular girls. I was not a cheerleader. I wasn't, home, I wasn't on the home, even on the homecoming court, much less the homecoming queen. But <laughs> I definitely was not lacking for dates. Mm. So I, I had plenty of boys interested in taking me on dates. And by the time I was a junior, I was dating uh, college guys. Um, you know, my mom had to meet them before I could go out with them, but that's okay. But, uh, <laughs> they were all pretty nice, but, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I did. Okay. I think what I had probably more than beauty was confidence mm. Mm. and maybe that was why I was, you know, more attractive as far as the modeling is concerned, because you can be pretty all day long. But if you can't walk out on that catwalk and pretend like you know what you're doing, you might as well just walk off before you mm. get halfway down the runway. You have to you have to fake it to make it. Just uh, out of curiosity, your your father being a professor, you meet these boys who would come to pick you up or that, that would take you out. Was there some sort of uh, did your father ever give you this the a sign that he wanted you know, an intelligent uh, boy to take you out or did he not care so much about intelligence and more of uh, care for respect and other qualities about them? Respect and other qualities. Definitely. And your confidence, it's really interesting. I, I appreciate that you say that because it's very easy, obviously, when we're talking about modeling to focus on the beauty, like the actual beauty of the person, uh, the outside beauty. But it's interesting that you say confidence is just as important it you make it sound like how long did it take you actually no here's the question i want to ask you where did that confidence come from for you uh that is a really good question and i think it is a fake it to make it thing because i never really thought of myself as pretty mm. i but when they asked me to put clothes on because i work out and i take good care of my body i can wear almost anything and look good <laughs> in it. And so then they say, walk on this runway or stand in front of this camera. And I, you know, my face is going to do what my face is going to do, but I feel confident that the clothes look good on me. And so I, I guess maybe it comes from, uh, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. This is, this is the $64 question here. Where does confidence <laughs> come from? I think it's an upward spiral. You know, you're confident, mm. and so you do something, and then you succeed, and then you have more confidence, and so then you try something new. And I, and that's, I think it's just mm. having positive experiences, and I think it's not being afraid to try new things. So would you say that the first day you were – well, the first day, I guess, you would have been in high school when you first modeled, but um, just, you know, when the modeling sort of started to kick up and you were doing gigs, um, were you comfortable right away? In front of the camera? Pretty much, yeah. And yeah. that comes from the confidence you have. Uh, have you ever seen another model you can just blatantly see on their face that they are not comfortable? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how does that uh, affect a set? So, you know, have, given a confident model as opposed to a, an insecure model or an uncomfortable model, I mean, do you just feel that in the room? Are the directors having to... Uh, press them more, you know, what's the difference between a confident model and an uncomfortable model um, in terms of a set? Well, it, depending on what you're doing, it can be different. So if it's a photo shoot, then the unconfident model will just kind of be ignored and they, they won't, they won't be called, you know, because mm. when it, when, if it's a, if it's a photo shoot and they're, and they're moving people through if there's no confidence or the pictures aren't coming, they'll just take that model off and, and that model won't, won't get very many 
<laughs> many pictures or clothing changes. If it's a runway show, backstage at a runway show is chaos. <laughs> chaos. And there is no time for anybody to not be confident. And so I, I guess, <laughs> you know, sometimes the, the girls and there's guys back there too, but sometimes the girls are, are really supportive of each other and they'll say, Hey, look, you got this, you know, come on, suck it up. Mm. But yeah, it, 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 and you, they'll get yelled at. I mean, if somebody's trying to put clothes on them and they're saying, I, you know, they'll just say, <laughs> suck it up. It's not about you. It's about what you're wearing. And it's not, it's not about the model. It's about what they mm. have on. Mm. So, you know, I've always been curious. I think you might be the first um, model that I've interviewed. I would be curious just by virtue of being a model or having modeled so much. Um, have you ever been charged with being superficial or shallow simply by being a model? Um, not, no, no, not wow. really. Yeah, I've always wondered, not that like I would think that clearly just based on what you told me already, you you break the mold perhaps, or maybe it's more um maybe it's more widespread than than it is, but you know, you have two degrees. Uh you you're you must have been pretty good at math to have done accounting. Um and it's sort of I think people I would imagine look at models and say, Oh, they have it so easy, they just have to be beautiful. Um so you've never felt judged by others in in that way where they think you're shallow or superficial or something maybe you know maybe by other other girls that haven't met me in person but mm. you know i don't walk into a party and go hey i'm a model <laughs> you know yeah. if they happen to know because they've seen my pictures or something but i i'm i hope that as soon as someone meets me and talks to me, they know that, I mean, I'm just a regular person. It's like, I'm not, by the way, I'm not, I'm not Christy Brinkley here. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not a supermodel. I'm just a regular person. And, you know, just because I happen to flatten the 2D well, you know, when, cause that's what happens, right? When, when you're, someone takes a picture of you, it flattens your body to 2D. So mm. your nose goes this way and your chin goes that way and your belly fat <laughs> goes this way. You know, just because I happen to flatten well, that's just, you know, everybody has something. That's my mm. superpower. What's your superpower? Everybody has one. Mm. Everybody has one. And mine is probably less useful than, than yours. So there's no reason to be jealous of me just because I happen to take a good photo. I mean, that's what good is that? <laughs> Um, I've, I've always wondered this as well, and I know it may be a sensitive subject, but have you ever had a, a creepy encounter on set with like a director or producer? Um, just, be, you know, you're, you're just a beautiful woman in a, a bathing suit. Um, have you ever encountered unprofessional people? A few times. Yeah. I try to avoid situations where I would be one-on-one -on -one with a photographer that I don't know. Mm. Mm. And there's a website called Model Mayhem that was really popular five or six years ago, and it's kind of fallen off now. But everybody was using that medium to book gigs a few years ago. And almost everybody that reached out to me on that gig was like, hey, will you shoot nude with me for free? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so... I will say, however, that I think most of my negative experiences have been more on the acting side. Oh, wow. Than on the modeling side. Most mm -hmm. of the modeling gigs, I mean, usually there's more than one person there when you go to a modeling gig, right? There's the photographer, mm -hmm. there's the stylist, there's the whoever's holding the bounce light. I mean, usually there's three or four different people there. And then a lot of times I will bring someone with me. I'll just mm -hmm. bring a friend or, a, you know, an escort or whatever, um, or, you, you know, or someone that, that I know just so that I feel safe if it's a, if it's a situation that's kind of sketchy, but normally mm. if somebody is going to pay you a non-refundable booking fee, you know, it's usually pretty legit. <laughs> well, you know, this, this, uh, will you pose nude for me for free stuff? The answer to that is no. And should be for any, <laughs> any model out there, by the way, even if you're just getting started, girls and you think, oh, this is a great way I can get some photos for my portfolio. Don't do it. It's not, it's not worth it to put yourself in, in a sketchy situation like that. 
Ah, uh, so you're saying you can a situation like that? You at the the best practice is to just avoid it. Don't put yourself in that um, situation in the first place. That's the best approach, you would say. Yeah, definitely. If it's not someone that you, if it's not a fog photographer that you know or that you know of, for example, a friend of yours has worked with that photographer mm. and says, yeah, but they're they're good. You know, it, if it if it doesn't feel if it feels if it doesn't feel right, listen to your gut and don't do it. Suppose um, this could be purely imaginary because it sounds like you're it sounds like sets really are more often than not professional and there's nothing um, sketchy about them so long as you uh, choose the right situation. Suppose you are, though, in an uncomfortable situation and there's probably a variety of things you could do. It, assume it's not just one on one because I imagine that's very a very sketchy situation. But you know, even a small number of people and you you feel uncomfortable. Do you think it's best to just try to keep your distance and stay polite, or just be firm and say, "Hey, I don't like that. Don't do that." I think you you have to be firm. You have to be clear up front. You have to read, you know, the paperwork that they send you of what they're expecting you to do. And then if they mm. ask you to do something that you didn't agree to, you have to be firm. And if mm. you can't come to an agreement, and I've done this before, you just say, I'll, I'm, you know, I'm out and I'll refund <laughs> your money. And I'm sorry that we couldn't work it out. So. I, I feel like that's tough. I, I can imagine like a young girl just getting into the field, maybe right out of high school. And, and I know that this could be, the, it could be, it could also be for boys too. It's, it's, on the spectrum. But, uh, you know, when I was young, I, I had a lot of trouble saying no and don't do that to people. I felt I was afraid of hurting their feelings. Um, you know, what would you say to a young person about if they felt the way I felt that they are afraid to say no, what, how would you, um, counsel them? Well, I, I totally get that. And I have trouble saying no too, but business is business. And I think having someone there with you is key. So if somebody mm. is there with you and you're checking with, in with them and you're saying this doesn't feel right and they're saying I agree it doesn't feel right, they're standing there with you and they, they will back you up when you say, no, I'm not going to <laughs> climb in that tree or no, I'm not going to wear that shirt mm. with no, that top with no bra underneath or or no, you can't follow me, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that they want to, that they want to <laughs> do that doesn't feel right. I think having someone there with you that, you know, is really, really important. Mm. Mm. And I've also noticed, um, slight in just in a different direction here, you also utilize Patreon. What, uh, tell me a little bit about that. I know a lot of models do that nowadays. Um, how do you, how do you utilize that, uh, platform? So that's pretty new for me. I only just started that in June and I, I never really wanted to do it. I've, I've always been just happy. I've had my Instagram for years and I've always been happy to just share whatever photos I get from a, a photo shoot or from selfies or whatever with mm. people because I like to make people smile and, and, and people seem to enjoy it. I mean, I don't have a jillion followers, but I have a few <laughs> and, um, so in June, however, you know, I kept getting people wanting to see some of my more uncensored photos. So I started mm. out in about, I don't know, March or April. We got kind of bored, right? Because of the COVID shutdown and I was kind of bored. And, and so I started a private Instagram and I tried to post some less censored photos on the private Instagram because I thought, well, that won't get reported <laughs> because the only people that will be on there will be people that have asked to follow me. And I've added because it's private, right? Yeah. Well, Instagram still won't let you post anything. And I was, listen, I don't do anything that that's, that's that over the top. Believe me, <laughs> This was just a little bit of, you know, kind of teasy uncensored kind of stuff. So I said, well, then I guess I'll just go to Patreon it doesn't mm -hmm. cost anything to start one. And if people like it and they join it, then I'll keep it. And if nobody is interested, then I'll shut it down. And, you know, so far, so good. It seems to people seem to like it. And and I'm able to post things there 
that I can't post on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, by the way, mm. you me away. I just started TikTok and they won't let you post <laughs> anything either. So, you know, what would you say to the critics? And of course, you know, a lot of these questions I'm imagining, these evil people, they, you know, more than likely they, maybe they don't exist and maybe they don't exist in your world, but just for the sake of a a fun conversation, what would you say to the critics that say, oh, that's, you know, uh, disgusting to sell these provocative photos of yourself. It's shameful, debasing, you know, what's your counter argument to that? Or if not a counter argument, your response well, I do get a little of that, and I've really experienced that on TikTok. Be- uh, people just want to leave a nasty comment, uh, put it, put your clothes on, Grandma, and, and you know, and this kind of thing. And uh, I just delete the comments because they mm-hmm. make me feel bad, and I fi- figure, well, I don't, I don't need to feel bad, so I'll just delete that comment. So I delete mm-hmm. them. But uh, uh, get, more on the moral side. You know, I struggle with that myself a little bit. I mean, but I'm not doing what I do. Believe me, is not pornography. And number two, there's plenty of free pornography on the Internet. (laughs) It's not of me. okay? because I don't do that. But if you if somebody really wants to see that, they don't need to be bothering with me. They can go get that for free all day long. Um, I I you know, my goal is to make people smile and bring somebody a little bit of joy and happiness and, and, you know, some warm, fuzzy, tingly feelings or, or whatever, you know, just a little bit of fun and just have some fun. So I don't think it's immoral, but I I do get that. I get that from Mm. people that, that can't, you know, they'll unfollow me. They can't believe that I would (laughs) post that picture with my belly hanging out or, or, you know, my, gosh, you can almost see your nipple or something like that. You know, it's like, well, you know, I got another one. I got two of those. So if you almost (laughs) saw one, you know, it's not like you never saw one before. I mean, the human body is beautiful. I love Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And I think she was very controversial in her day. Now everybody remembers her fondly. But back Mm -hmm. in the 50s, a lot of women hated her. And they hated her because she was... She would pose nude. She would wear provocative clothes. Everybody thought she was, I don't know if she really was or not, but everybody thought she was having an affair with the president, (laughs) you know, with President Kennedy. Women hated her because they were, the core of that is they were jealous of her. And nobody Mm. has any reason to be jealous of me. I don't have anything that, anybody else either can't have or that's better than something else you have that I don't have. There's no reason to be, to be jealous and to, and to be mean to people. And it's not immoral. I'm not, I'm not selling my body for money here. I mean, not really. Well, maybe I am, but anyway, (laughs) I, I don't know. I just don't think it's immoral. And Marilyn Monroe said the human body is beautiful. It's meant to be enjoyed, not covered up. And it's one of my favorite quotes, you know, we're all, we're all beautiful. And, you know, if you have pretty eyes, put some girls, you know, or guys, put some eye makeup on and show it off. If you have pretty hair, do your hair pretty. I have a nice body. Mm. Why not? Why not show it in a non disgusting, you know, non pornographic way. I'm, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't appear that way to me, of course. I, I, I doubt there's probably not less people who think that than I think. Um, so I would wonder, it, it leads me, you know, your willingness to, um, to, to take these photos and, you know, you say it's like not pornographic by any stretch, which I agree with. Um, does that leads me to believe that, you know, you're, you have a pretty open perception of uh, human sexuality in general. And I'm not asking for details here. I'm just saying, uh, is that your per, per, uh, perspective on human sexuality? People should be able to enjoy what they want to enjoy and do what they want to do with their bodies. Absolutely. I, I absolutely believe that. And I, I pers- personally, for me, um, I believe in what's right for me is monogamy, but for people that don't people that are swingers, couples that are swingers, people that are in open relationships, whatever works for you 
works for you and no judgment on my part at all. But, you know, I love sex. I, I think sex is great. I, I enjoy it. And, um, I, I think that it's something that people should not be so afraid of. I think we're kind of, uh, uptight about it in the United States for some reason, which is weird. <laughs> You know, but you go to France and people are, you know, there's nude beaches everywhere and whatever. And people aren't nearly as uptight as we are here for some reason. (laughs) Have you experienced uh, international differences? Have you been to France in these places where it's just a little different? No, I guess I'm not speaking from personal experience. I'm speaking more from talking to people Mm -hmm. about it. I haven't traveled as much as I would love to travel. So you're also, it's funny that you said uh, you had, you had gotten into drama when you were in high school. Is that right? Yes. So before the modeling, you were actually more interested in the acting, it sounds like. Yeah, I actually, I did some, uh, I did a little TV show when I was in the second grade. It was on PBS. (laughs) And then in middle school, I did some plays. And then in high school, I got into the drama class and the drama club. And I really enjoyed acting. I acted all through, uh, all through university. And then, like I said, I really, at that point, all I had really done was theater because that's all there really was in Starkville, Mississippi. I mean, we didn't even have local news station. You had to go to the next town over even to have a local news station. So when (laughs) I moved to LA, I, I wanted to try my hand at acting, but it, you know, it's very competitive. It's Mm. every audition I went to, there were 500 other girls that were taller than me and blonder than me and prettier than me and had more experience than me and better actresses than me. And (laughs) after a while, you know, it was, it was disheartening. So, Mm. but I have picked up a few things here, you know, lately, a couple years ago, I did a Mercedes Benz commercial. And I did a little independent film and then I just finished actually season one of a TV show called Shooters, which is a product of Freedom Media and some other production companies. And it's just about to release. So I'm really excited. It's uh, it's, it's a funny little sitcom <laughs> and I hope uh, I hope it'll be something everybody enjoys. That's a lot of work. I mean, my goodness, I. Uh... Got yeah, I just the things you just rattled off being acting when you're in second grade. Uh, so did you have lines in that show? I mean, were you uh, an extra? How how was that experience? Because you're what I don't know seven, eight in second grade. Yeah, I was about. I was probably eight. I was probably yeah. I was it was it was in the spring, so I was probably eight. No, I didn't have to learn any lines, but I did have to talk. <laughs> so it was, it was public television and I would, you know, they would ask me questions or they would ask me to do something or they would say, they would ask me to explain something because they wanted to, they were talking about the differences in the way that children explain things and the way that different children explain things. So um, I didn't oh, wow. have to talk, but no, I didn't have to <laughs> memorize anything, but middle school when I did plays, I did, but memorizing is easy. People that say they can't memorize stuff is just a mental block. Anybody can memorize things. Mm. And shooters, that's, I think you said it's the most recent thing you did. How did you land that? I mean, did you have a buddy in there? Did you uh, see it in the newspaper? I mean, how do you land a gig like that? So that particular one, usually you'll land a gig from a casting call on Facebook or on IMDb or somewhere like on the internet. Shooters for me was a fluke. And yes, I had a friend that uh, was in it and I, I had not even been cast and they were already filming. And oh, wow. Already, already laid some, you know, had some film in the can or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and uh, they had me up for something. They had me up to the set. I think they wanted to, um, I, I'm a writer also, and they had me up to look at some of the dialogue lines or something. Oh, wow. And we were, after we were finished and we were sitting around the dinner table, just eating some Pandas Express or some, (laughs) you know, Chinese food. 
And the, <laughs> the guy was, um, the producer was actually walking around with his camera filming us while we were eating dinner. And I got a call two days later and he said, we want to write you into the show. And I said, oh my God, you know, I mean, of course I, I flipped out and they ended up writing me into the show. Um, a, a nice, you know, it's a supporting role, but it's a, it's a nice recurring role and it's, it's pretty funny. So. <laughs> What's your response? I imagine, um, or actually, I don't know, because I've never been on a, an actual set like that. So I was going to, what I'm going to ask is that, uh, what's your response to seeing yourself on film, whether you saw yourself on the dailies of this, uh, sh uh, of shooters or from something else, you know, what do you, you know, you're sitting there looking at the screen, maybe it's uncut footage. W what do you feel? You know, or do you cringe? Oh, that's me on there. Or do you smile? Do you feel proud? Uh, nervous, you know, what are the emotions and thoughts going through your head when you're seeing yourself on film? Um, I, you know, normally it's good. I, I try not to pick on myself too much because it's really easy to do that. It's easy to look at yourself and say, man, I love that line, or I wish I had said that like this. So it's better to just let yourself make one or two comments inside your heads for, for future growth and let the rest of it go and, and enjoy how it's been edited together because when you're shooting it, when they're filming it, you don't, you don't understand how it's going to look when it's all edited together. So usually it's a happy, <laughs> it's a really nice surprise how mm. everything edits together and they get the music under it and they get the, you know, whoever you were, you know, the different shots where they're, you know, they switch from one point of view to the other and things like that. So it's usually <laughs> pretty fun to see what they've done with it. In terms of being directed by a, a film director or being directed by a photographer, do you as an individual take criticism well or does it hurt your feelings? Like, for instance, I'm, I'm just not very good at taking criticism. It always feels personal to me, even though I know it's not. For you, how do you feel when you're being directed and it's, you're being criticized? So whenever I walk on a set... And, and my mom taught me this when I was in the second grade, when I was going on that set, she said, whatever they tell you to do, I'm right. And she was right there, of course. So she was going to stop anything that was untoward and it was PBS. So there wasn't going to be anything, but she said, you, your goal is to do what you're told and to be the easiest person in this room for them to work with, because that's the reason <laughs> they will have you back. So when I walk on a set, I look in the mirror, you know, either really or just proverbially, and I tell myself, your job today is to be the easiest person for the directors and producers to work with on this set today so that they will mm. have you back. If you mm. fight and argue and whatever, the worst thing, by the way, girls, guys out there who want to be actors and actresses, this is the worst thing you can do. Walk on the set and say, I think my line should be X, Y, Z. <laughs> or do you mind if I say it like this instead of like that? Or I have a great idea for a way to change this. <laughs> because the problem, see, is you may think you know your character, but you don't know how that may tie in to all the rest of the storyline. So if they have you say, um, see you later, and you think it would be funnier to say, see you later, alligator, and you say that, well, I mean, they may be tying this see you later thing all through the, the different episodes. and the di You don't know what the writers mm. are doing. So that is the, the quickest way to get yourself written out of a show is to walk mm. on there and try to change your lines or have a bunch of really, hey, I've got a great idea. No, that's not your job. Your job is to show up and say your lines and and be easy to work with so and yes yeah, sometimes it's hard sometimes i take it personally and sometimes i go home and take my makeup off and i get and then i get upset but while you're on the set you you just do as you're told you take direction and and you just suck it up or you or you won't be back so you're also a writer and just to to uh 
to segue into your writing stuff, that's an area where you do get to make all the choices and all your ideas you get to consider deeply and actually. You've written, I think your latest book is The Venus Glass. Is that correct? That is correct. And I noticed that you go by a pseudonym, which is it appears to be Anjaya Morgan Lewer, or how do you say it? So it's Anjay is the first uh, name, mm-hmm. Morgan, and then the last name is pronounced Lewer. It's it's Welsh, mm. and it's a family and, thing. When I said it, my sisters laughed because they got it. Nobody else understands. It's you know, it's weird relatives that we've had that had weird <laughs> names, and I just strung them all together. And what was the thinking behind that? I imagine, I actually imagine maybe using a pseudonym myself if I ever uh, turn to a novel or something. Um, what was uh, behind your decision to use a, a pseudonym? Honestly, it was to protect my parents because they were living in that, still living in that small town in the South. And my books are steamy. They have, uh, you know, they, they have some, some little sex passages in them and stuff and being, in a small town in the South, I did not want them to get any flack from anybody. So I decided I would write under under a pen name. Mm. On some level, do you feel like it, you know, at least in the process of writing, did it feel like an alter ego, like you were this different person? Or did you just feel like your normal self and it 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 really was just protecting your parents? No, it was actually, it was freeing for me as well, because since I was going to be, it was going to be a secret, not only to protect my parents, but I mean, it was a secret, you know, for people that I didn't tell that was me. Now my pictures are on the back of my books, but in the beginning they weren't. So who was going to know? Nobody unless I told them. And it was very freeing. It, It freed me to write things that I might not have written otherwise. Definitely. So it sounds like uh, you said there's a few steamy passages in there. I feel like popular culture has always painted, um, for lack of better words, um, let's call that genre um, where it's all that erotica, I think it's called. Um, So you have some erotica passages in there. Do you think it's true that those passages and those books in general that focus on that are geared more towards women than they are men? And if so, why? Why is it that women like to read that more than men? So I used to think that it was geared more toward women. And I've always felt like my target audience was women. And yet I have found with, with each book that I've, at least the people that have reached out to me and said, I read your book have been more than 50% (laughs) men. Now I don't know why, maybe it's because they, they want to talk to me or maybe the women is maybe there are more women reading it and just not talking to me about it. But mm. um, I think women like reading those kinds of books because you know our our se- I don't know our sex life is boring. Maybe I don't I don't know. <laughs> oh, so it's fantasy. There's a fantasy element There's to it. There's an absolute fantasy element to it, and I maybe or maybe not. Generally speaking, women may be more in in touch with that, you know, that part of our imagination. You know, maybe we'd rather read it than just have a daydream. Whereas Mm. I'm I'm not a psychologist, but I'm just thinking maybe a guy would rather watch a video and a girl would rather read a book and then she can make the pictures in her own head Mm. kind of thing. (laughs) So. So you've uh, you've written multiple things, um, the the latest being the Venus Glass, and I think you're working on um, unless it's out already, but it sounds like you're working on the coffee table book too, the Book of Richard. So yeah, I, I ran into a little snag with the Book of Richard. It was it's copyrighted, and I, I published one copy, but I'm having trouble finding a printer. Mm. <clears throat> So in general, when you uh, say just an example, just the Venus glass, you know, it's been out for a while now or once it's printed and it's out. Do you uh, flip through the book and you say, oh, God, I really wish I would have done this. Or when you look back at your written work, you can just see it as a thing in it and of itself. How How do you view your work after it's done? Well, yeah, it's kind of hard to know when it's done. Right. So 
Um, I have gone back into it and fixed a few typos that I have found, but I haven't made any major changes to any of my books at this point after they were published. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard. I'm writing right now a book called The Venus Effect, which mm. is the prequel to The Venus Glass. So it will occur in time before what happens in The Venus Glass. And it is some things about it are making me want to change the ending of The Venus Glass. But I, <laughs> I don't really want to change it. But, you know, there are some ways. Yeah. I get one. Yeah. So... It's, it can be hard. It's like a painting. I, I have friends that paint and they say it's hard to know when it's finished. You can always, <laughs> you know, you can always make that little change, right? Mm. Yeah. So I, and I wonder too, because you said you were a good student and you had, uh, your father was educated, a professor, and you did well in school and you, you graduated with two degrees. Given that you were a good student and uh, I would assume intelligent, you, you seem intelligent, uh, how much of that helped your writing? I mean, could somebody who didn't have that background just as easy or just as good write a, a, a book, a coherent book? Or, you know, how much weight do you do you uh, put on your education in terms of your writing ability? Well, it certainly helps. But I think it's more of a God-given talent. Some people are mm. meant to write books and some are not, but you could learn how to write a book. And you, there are books about how to write a book, mm. but you're right. There has to be a cohesive storyline. If you read my first book, by the way, which I don't market anymore, there is no cohesive storyline because I was learning how to ah. write a book. So there are books about how to write a book. There are different methods that people use to write books I think one of the most important things about writing a book is a good command of the English language and the knowledge of how to use a dictionary and a thesaurus. Mm. And then the second thing that I highly recommend for everyone is a good editor because you think your book is good, but an editor is like you're too close to the forest to see the trees. <laughs> and an editor helps with that. Mm. Kathy Cameron, I have just one more question for you. I maybe, you know, when your next book comes out and talk again, I feel like I could pick your brain on all the subjects we hit. Um, I have just one more question for you. You can answer it any way you like. Kathy Cameron, who the hell are you? Well, you know, I had coffee the other day with somebody that I really need to get to know a lot better. And that was myself. So wow. I hope that I'm someone that is always growing and always learning. And I'm interested in all kinds of different things. And I love people. And I think that is the core of my life. I love people. I love meeting people and talking to people. And I love being part of the human race. Mm -hmm.